Hello, good people of the internet. Welcome to the Bituation Room. I am your host, Francesca Fiorentini. Thank you so much for pressing play. Thank you very much for, for tuning in. Thank you so much for setting aside your alone time to be alone with me and other people. Um, we have a great show today. I was so happy to nab Jacob Silverman, whose brain I want to pick about the TikTok ban, um, but more broadly, what it means for um, the tech billionaires who run our lives and what they plan to do with them. Um, and that will be a fun little digression from a broad overarching, oh my effing God, I can't believe we are co-signing this kind of genocide in Gaza sort of wall of coverage that's going to happen in the next hour and change. Um, only to be chased by some discussion with comedian John Marco Cerezi about uh, Trump's plans to protect the whites. Not sure if you know this, but the whites are under attack. Um, and his second administration, should there be one, has a lot of plans to protect it. Uh, and that includes going after DEI initiatives, which, by the way, they're already going after and they're succeeding in obliterating. So, We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then to close out this um, this show, uh, just a little cosmic note from the sun and the moon to Earth. Uh, Yes, we're going to talk about the eclipse. What does it mean? Why does everyone have to have a take on it? And what is our take on it? How will we not miss out on this opportunity for clickbait? Uh, Fair warning, the next hour and a half will contain not one, but two Alex Jones quotes. And no, I won't attempt his voice because if you're hearing mine, it's just starting to recover. So I can't do the gravel if I actually want to, um, you know, continue to be able to speak. But it's going to be, it'll be interesting. Uh, Part of our Gaza coverage is going to be how and why some people on the right are actually have better politics on this than President Joe Biden. But before we do that, guys, take a little moment to rate this podcast. Give it five stars on Apple Podcasts or on Spotify. Um, Share and like the stream if you're watching live. Subscribe right now. What are you doing if you're not subscribed to this channel? Uh, And of course, remember that this show is only a third of the Bituation Room. That's right. There are two other shows I have introduced. Wednesdays for patrons. That's right, guys. We're going to do a little dessert situation. It'll be like an after, little after party, little dessert for the patrons. Patreon.com slash Bituation Room, where we do extra material, bonus content stories we weren't able to cover last week for the bonus bish. I went into my appearance on Piers Morgan, sort of blow by blow. Um, and uh, I think I was dumber for it. Uh, if you watch that appearance, you'll understand why. And then also the most obnoxious article ever written about why you should marry an older man, supposedly. So get at that. Uh, Patreon.com slash Bituation Room. Again, how you support this show. You also get the show ad free. Because, yeah, there are ads, not to brag. And speaking of those ads or partnerships, you get discounts on the American Prospect magazine. I have a new piece out in the American Prospect. I'm really proud of it. It's about feminism and the Republican Party. Um, It's super fun. So get at that. And also, so remember, we've got Wednesdays for patrons. You can watch it free 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern on YouTube or Twitch. But if you want to watch it back, if you want to have it in your little ear holes, become a patron, become a member, become a subscriber on Twitch. And now I am doing the Bernie Sanders on Twitch. I have hands probably as big as his. Um, and with that, guys, get your bitch caps on, everybody. <laughs> uh, what are you bitching about? So um, I'm being alerted that something's wrong with my uh, quality. So I hope that is not the case. And I hope maybe I can fix this before everything goes to sh- goes to crap. I apologize if I have bad Wi-Fi for y'all or not Wi-Fi. I can turn it off and see if it gets even worse. Um, keep me posted.
All right, we're going to have to, we may have to uh, just ride this out for the next little bit. Um, or we come back. Or we just do a do-over. Here's what I was going to say, guys. Did you know that Mercury is also in retrograde? So, of course, this is going to happen. In fact, there's going to be a blackout at any moment right now. Jacob's waiting in the wings. My internet's not working. Everything is falling apart. But, Paige, should we continue? I don't want to continue if y'all are, if it's like really, really bad. Maybe we do a little bit of, maybe we do some weight music. Ooh, I can't do that. I can't do weight music. We might just have to sign off. Um, all right. So why don't we just see if it, this fix is itself as I just sort of blather on. I'm going to uh, get rid of the, I got rid of the Wi-Fi uh, and so I'm hardwired. We'll see. Um, but it's real bad right now. Um, but anyway, I wanted to continue on by bitching about. Everyone says it's fine enough. Okay, cool. Um, every single day, obviously, uh, we are subject to some of the worst stories, uh, that I think we've ever heard coming out of Gaza specifically. Um, and every day you think this is going to, this is it. This is the bottom of the barrel. This is as we're as bad as it gets. And then the next day happens and you read a new headline, you see a new story and it is even more depraved and it feels like a Mad Libs game, right? It's like fill in worse war crime you could possibly imagine and scramble it around and that is what Israel is committing with the assistance of the United States government. And yesterday, I was like, we're going to talk about the Al-Shifa hospital. Um, obviously, we're going to be talking about what's been going on. Because after two weeks, um, Palestinians in Gaza finally got access to Al-Shifa. And it is a utter bloodbath. Um, there's nothing left of it. It's a massive complex that has been completely destroyed. Um, hundreds and hundreds of patients, um, body parts found dead. Um, Israeli fire upon anyone who tried to rescue their family members. I mean, it is, it is absolutely depraved. And this is, again, after they already raided Al-Shifa. Remember when we talked about this four months ago? They went back because it wasn't enough. They had to make sure that there was no way that this could ever be used as a medical facility. Al-Shifa, by the way, is something like 30% of Gaza's health infrastructure. So there was that, right? But then, of course, this morning, we all wake up to the story that seven rescue, not rescue workers, excuse me, seven aid workers who were delivering food and necessary food aid to the starving population of Gaza who work at the World Central Kitchen were bombed as they were in a convoy on their way to deliver said food um, to the people of Gaza. Um, they had set up a pier. They set up a warehouse. They were cooking. They were filming videos of themselves cooking and getting ready. Um, and as they made their way um, to the delivery drop-off point, they were attacked summarily. All three of their, um, all three of their uh, vehicles were attacked in succession. It seems like some of the survivors in one tried to go to the other, which was bombed. And all three of them were bombed. And six aid workers, one Palestinian, three uh, British citizens, one from Poland and one from Australia were all killed. Um, this is what it looked like. So Israel says it was not targeted. I beg you. And if you're listening, just imagine a um, a vehicle with a hole right through the top of the set, like through the roof of it, completely through the roof of it. There's one, there's two, there's three vehicles, and they were all very explicitly targeted. And I've seen this before. I've seen, you know, a, a rescue worker, specifically an ambulance, with a bomb hole right through it, just, a, just where a missile went right through although we don't have confirmation about exactly which missile was used. And the other place I saw that was during one of the other wars on Gaza. And that's when I knew. And I was, you know, working in leftist media at the time then. I still am now. And you see these images of a Red Cross 
with just a hole through it. And you're like, yeah, these fools deliberately target aid workers. They target anyone providing humanitarian aid. And that's exactly what they did, even though they say they didn't. And even though Netanyahu said later, uh, we didn't deliberately target them, but also this happens in war. This happens in war. Here are two of the members um, of that convoy, uh, Zomi Frankom, who is Australian, and Damien Sabal, who was uh, Polish. Um, there are no words for this kind of atrocity. Like, I just spent the whole morning muttering and swearing and cussing and crying and, you know, you see the children looking on to look at what happened to these people. And you, you realize like no child should have to see any of this. But to know that these are people coming to help you, coming to feed you, coming to do something. By the way, they had 400 tons of food aid. They were able to, they were on their way to deliver 100 of those tons and, four, and 300 got sent back. Because there's no way that the World uh, Central Kitchen is going to be continuing with this um, mission to help the people of Gaza not starve. It is ethnic cleansing. It is genocide. The goal is to wipe Gazans off the map. The goal is to kill them, to maim them. We are on the precipice of another of an imminent invasion of Rafah. And the goal is to starve them and to kill them and to absolutely obliterate their name. That's it. And the last people to understand this and to actually fully appreciate that is, uh, you know, the Trump, excuse me, the Trump, the Biden administration, not unlike the Trump administration on this particular issue. Um, here is Secretary Blinken uh, speaking about this attack on the world's central kitchen. And you can see some of the footage and here are his words for Netanyahu. We shouldn't have a situation where people who are simply trying to help their fellow human beings are themselves at grave risk. Uh, we've spoken directly to the Israeli government about this particular incident. We've urged a swift, a thorough, an impartial investigation to understand exactly what happened. And as we have throughout this conflict, We've impressed upon the Israelis the absolute imperative of doing more to protect innocent civilian lives, be they Palestinian children, women and men, or be they aid workers. Do more. Do how much? Like, how much do you want? Do you want 5% more? Do you want 50% more? How many aid workers do you want dead? Do you want one aid worker dead? Do you want seven? Um, how many uh, civilians do you want dead? Do you want 32,000 civilians? Um, do you want, like... How many um, death zones do you want outside of Al Shifa Hospital, according to Haaretz? Do you want um, one kill zone, two kill zones, no kill zones? Again, as the Israeli army admits that they have just zones where if you step foot in them, you'll be murdered. As we did see um, from released drone footage just a couple weeks ago. The last thing I'll say about this is not only is the Biden administration so pitifully and so painfully weak, but here's what gets me the most. We're now, we are also not only on the precipice of an invasion of Rafah, but on the precipice of a full-out regional war. Israel's attacking uh, the Iranian consulate in Syria. Israel is attacking southern Lebanon. It's likely there will be an invasion of southern Lebanon. And who is this teeing up for, people? Who could this, this is what's so wild to me. Not only, because maybe, Maybe Joe Biden, maybe by November, would pull it back just a little bit because this is getting so out of hand. Oh, yeah, genocide the Palestinians. But let's let's not get it too out of hand. Who is this teeing up for? This is teeing up for Mr. Donald Trump, who whose party is fully ready to be like, yeah, why don't we go Nagasaki on Gaza, as was stated by uh, Representative Wahlberg not so long ago? like. Do we understand the fire that we're playing with? Forget the moral level. I've said this a million times. On a geopolitical level, 
just how dangerous all of this is for everyone involved and how how excited Israel would be to pull the United States into a hot war with Iran. Rock on, baby. All because we couldn't cut the fucking purse strings for this genocide. It is so sick. And if you want one more little here, here's just a thing that keeps me up at night, y'all. Lastly, before we get into this, here's from Cheetah Parsi. He's been on this show translating uh, um, what a Swedish aid worker uh, had to report from Gaza said, a little boy with a bruised face, no more than 10, 11 or 12, exited an ambulance. I asked if he was okay. I saw blood dripping from his backpack. Quote, do you know what I have in the backpack? He asked, my little brother Ahmed. So when I say that every day there's something more horrifying than you've heard, that's what I'm talking about. Every single day. These people are carrying their brothers home in their backpacks? What are, what, what, where do you go from here? What happens? When is enough? It doesn't matter if all of the aid workers were American. It doesn't matter. You understand that, right? Literally all morning I've been like, I do think Taylor Swift needs to go to Gaza. This is it. And even then, even if she dies, because she would die, she'd absolutely be killed. Wouldn't she go out a goddamn martyr? Like, wouldn't that, you know what I'm saying? And then Beyonce could be like queen and then be the whole thing. And like Cowboy Carter, yeah. The point is thus. <laughs> When is enough enough? It is up to us. It is up to us to sanction or argue for sanctions, to boycott where we can, to divest where we can, and to keep the goddamn pressure on because no one is doing anything. You see how weak Blinken is there, uh, even though he's he's sorry. Uh, and uh, Biden sends his condolences. Spare us. Okay, with that, now that I have been thrown off my game, but thrown back on, I'm so excited to have back on the show for a real show, not just a bonus. No, the bonus actually is great. The bonuses are the best because we get to just sort of wax for a very long time. But he is a journalist uh, based in New York writing about crypto tech, politics, and other issues and the co-author of the New York Times bestseller, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud. Jacob Silverman, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Um, Jacob, last time we were on, we talked a lot about Sam Bankman fried who like just got sentenced to 25 years in prison. Um, and you wrote about it for the nation. I just want to briefly ask you, you, you wrote a great piece for the nation about him and how he had some sort of parting words that seemed to prove that he learned nothing from <laughs> defrauding um, investors of $8 billion and then funneling into our political system. But any, any thoughts about the sentence and also like, what you want to see. Sure. Yeah, there are a couple of things I was trying to highlight in that piece. One is that um, this argument that's been floating around a lot, actually, but really been used by Bankman Fried and himself and his lawyers is that uh, there, no one really lost money. There was no real loss, even though we know that Bankman Fried stole $8 billion in customer funds and then used it for all kinds of purposes. And obviously people haven't been able to get their money back. So uh, I was really trying to address that issue. And then also address how this guy does seem to be delusional, or at least to really believe uh, his own kind of uh, distorted opinion of himself and how he can always fix everything if only people would give him enough time and listen to him. Um, so, you know, so in that way, I think he actually represents a lot of kind of historic fraudsters. And, and uh, that's what I took away from a lot of this is that you know, Sam Bankman Fried is not that special. The fraud is is big. And the story is interesting still to me, and there's some spicy sort of details in it all. But you know, he wasn't a genius. He was pretty good at at, at conning and manipulating people. But he also wasn't a genius or this you know small bean privileged boy from the West Coast that we, we like to hear about. He was simply a fairly intelligent con man who seemed to believe his own lies until the end. Uh, right. And, he says like, yeah. oh, I hope that my work will continue in some way. Your work in what? <laughs> Just like yeah. being a con artist? That's what I wonder, too, uh, because he, he gave this whole speech in which he's expect at the sentencing, which is he's expected to express remorse. He basically did the I, mistakes were made and I was responsible or I made mistakes kind of thing. Never really acknowledging that they're victims 
or express anything re like remorse. And he still thinks that somehow this could have been put right. Um, and then also he could have achieved these amazing philanthropic or kind of world changing ambitions without ever really telling us what those are. And if you look at what the guy did when he was at his height, I mean, he gave most of his supposed charitable contributions to organizations run by other effective altruists. You know, his brother debated buying the island nation of Nauru, and his brother was supposed to be kind of the moral <laughs> heart of this thing. Like, these are not serious people, or not people who um, have been stopped from achieving some kind of, um, you know, gr goodness for the world, in my opinion. So, okay, for those of you who are like, who, what, where, um, Jacob and I had a, a, first of all, read Jacob's article in The Nation, and also we had a long, hour-long discussion about Sam Bankman fried and his rise and all of this, and and Jacob tracks these megalomaniacal, some real, some fake billionaires in the tech space, and I think, you know, um, I'm, we'll talk about your forthcoming book in a little bit, but briefly on this, have we banned cryptocurrency donations at all in in congress or like super PACs funded by crypto or is that still on the books as far as i know no we have not banned that i mean i think there's a patchwork of, of state laws for for you know it depends what kind of elections you're talking about certainly uh I, i'm pretty sure that for committees uh so PACs where especially ones where you can donate a whole lot of money crypto donations are still uh, uh, acceptable but they have to be reported as a, a contribution of a, a thing of value I think mm. it might matter a little less in, in individual candidate donations because you have those lower uh, th those those lower limits of, of right. one or two thousand dollars. But uh, I think it matters with PACs, and I think it matters with companies like Coinbase saying that they're putting in hundreds of millions of real dollars into into this into lobbying. And I think it also matters post Sam Bankman Fried with the idea of dark money that there is both dollars and probably crypto. Um, going into this larger political project of both legitimizing crypto and pushing certain right wing ag agendas for which um, crypto is often very useful. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to talk about the right wing agenda. There's so much I want to talk to you about, but we don't have that much time. But briefly, we spoke about TikTok on this show, um, you know, in the ways that it seems like very handy that all of, you know, the pro Palestine. Um, accounts are are you know sort of lighting up TikTok at this time um when the US is trying to like suppress the amount of discussion of Palestinian human rights and oh lo and behold this bill gets picked up and passed by Congress to force a sale um or at least passed by the house but i think you and you had an interview a great interview with Paris Marx who's been on this show before on on their podcast um tech won't save us but about how that maybe is missing kind of the forest um for the trees here and that the forest is really about um, maybe this broader tr kind of trade war with China on the one hand, and then also what we need to do about data privacy on the other. So let's start with the, the data privacy stuff. You know, like, is there evidence that TikTok is worse than other social media apps when it comes to data harvesting and whatnot? Not necessarily, no. I mean, there have been some uh, whistleblower-style accusations that perhaps... You know, senior leadership at ByteDance or people connected to the Chinese government may have access to, to user data. And, and to be sure, um, but you know, some of that stuff remains a little murky. And, and to be sure, the Chinese government is authoritarian. You could call it a dictatorship. People have very few uh, personal or political rights there. And China probably does have ways in which to access the data that runs through Binance. On the other hand, um, Almost anything you say about China as a surveillance state and its relationship with its tech sector can be said with some modification about the United States. Right. And while uh, ByteDance has made some efforts, they have, for example, they had this Project Texas thing in which basically they're keeping a lot of U.S. customer data on servers in Texas run by Oracle. Um, so there have been some efforts to kind of reassure politicians and consumers. Uh, I, I think you also have to ask, well, what are you afraid of? I mean, certainly you probably don't want the Chinese government knowing, uh, having, you know, at will access to, to 100 million Americans phones, if, if that's really the, the fear, the ultimate fear here. But then, you know, are the US government has the same and are we planning on going to war with China? What is the sort of actual th 
threat here or, or case that we're, we're really trying to stave off. And right. I don't really want them surveilling people en masse. But at the same time, this kind of move is, is almost an acceleration of that threat posture of saying, hey, we're, pro we're in a Cold War with China. We may very well go to war with them. So we have to keep them out of uh, U.S. markets by any means possible. Well, that's interesting because, I, I mean, it doesn't seem like we have hard evidence that Ch the Chinese government is tracking us via by its holdings in ByteDance. You know, like like there's that ha that link hasn't yet been proven. And yet for American companies, we have proof that like the Zuckerbergs and the Facebooks have like contributed to, you know, um, crimes being committed against you know, like um, ethnic minorities in in or like, you know, um, in like. Myanmar, I believe it was, or like Philippines or like being used by Duterte to like track people, you know, like all this kind of stuff, the ways that um, Facebook and or Meta has collaborated with awful regimes to carry out heinous things against their own people. Um, anyway, but yeah, yeah I, I think, uh, you know, there's this also this question of why bite Dan uh, bite Dan why, why um, the TikTok in particular because the, the law is proposed, which hasn't been brought to a vote yet in, in the Senate, only names ByteDance and, and, um, and TikTok, it, but it leaves itself open to basically any company that either fulfills these certain thresholds or really that's deemed by the United States and by the president to be an adversary. So you're really starting this new kind of, of sanction or war uh, against foreign companies at the whim and direction of the president. Yeah. The other thing I'd say is, Whatever TikTok is collecting, you know, people have Chinese apps on their phones, other ones. They might, you might also have just, say, like a, a ruler app or, or a voice recorder or something that you don't even know is Chinese, but maybe has like uh, an ad network beacon or something like that in it so that it, it is sending back some data about what you're doing to Chinese servers that perhaps could get to the Chinese government. I mean, we're really talking about a systemic, broad thing here. So TikTok is not special in that regard. And then on that, and I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to overstate the xenophobia case because I do think it is a very, like, I think what matters more is, and, and this again is no like, yeah, yay, China, the Chinese government, but it kind of to, I think some points you've been making is how does a trade war, um, set a stage for a potential hot war? And to say nothing of the fact that if we're really serious about climate change and if the Biden administration is serious about reining it in, all roads lead through co cooperation with China if we see that as an existential threat. But at the same time, Biden is super hell bent on painting China as our, also our biggest ex existential threat. So what are your thoughts on this sort of like broader trade war idea with China and how tech relates to it and maybe thoughts on like the CHIPS Act, which I know some people have really heralded like, yay, national industry, this is good. But do you have another um, take on that? Well, I think one problem with the trade war and we really are in a broad based trade war with China about tech and and microchips and the U.S. has been trying to limit exports of key technologies and systems and, and really huge billion dollar deals between uh, all kinds of companies and China. But the question, the problem is, when does this end? And what is your end point, your goal? I mean, if we're all just sort of on the, econ on the capitalist te treadmill of technological development, I mean, when are we going to be happy and say, okay, we've won this thing right. in, in some way that's useful? And the, other, and the issue also, as you suggest, is that eventually this could easily be a hot war. Um, so already you have a lot of China hawks talk about basically going to war over Taiwan, not because of something about Taiwan necessarily, but because of, of TSMC, the semiconductor manufacturer, which is indeed one of the most important companies in the world. But, you know, it, 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 it's just basically to defend that. Or even you've had some China hawks say, we should preemptively destroy TSMC, this company that is sort of the workshop of the world for digital electronics, so China can't get it or, or have, you know, it's, it's crazy kind of thinking. And because, TSMC, we were just on with David mm -hmm. Dan. Is that the same company that's like working to create uh, more microchips here in this country? Yeah. So that gets us to the Chips Act, which is that 
Um, TSMC is exactly the kind of company of, that the U.S. would want to defend, but it's also one you want to n uh, nurture, perhaps, or help grow or, or partner with because it is seeking to expand into Germany and Japan and the U.S. and other places where, frankly, it kind of hedge its bets against a, catac a cataclysmic war surrounding Taiwan. Right. Um, so that, I mean, I do, I think the CHIPS Act it has good and bad, you know, I think we really do need to invest in infrastructure and actually building stuff in an enormous way. And this is, this is not something that works on venture capitalist timelines or budgets. This is like generational stuff where right. you have, and that's why sometimes you might have, to, or at least a government might think they have to give $5 billion to Intel to get them to build a fab or a foundry in Arizona or something like that. Um, the economics of it, I, I, I do have some issues with at times. But I think the, the sort of broader goal of, hey, we need semiconductor manufacturing here in the U.S. because it's good for the economy, it's good for jobs, and it's good for national security and also under, hopefully undermining the war machine and not sort of revving it up. Um, I, I, I see that all as, as moving sort of in the right direction. I, I guess I'm afraid I worry about where is the money going and who are some of the people kind of benefiting or leading it. Someone like, like uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI, who's a little bit late to the party, but is trying to get into semiconductor manufacturing, I find a lot less trustworthy than Intel, which for all of its problems, like this is the business it's in. Right. And, it, and so if you, if you have oversight and give them a whole bunch of money, they can probably build some some factories in Arizona or upstate New York that will be there for a while. Right. Well, on that, just re before we move off of TikTok, I have two more questions on it. One is, like, what kind of bill should we actually be passing other, you know, beyond when it comes to our data, when it comes to surveillance? Um, obviously, <laughs> the House isn't going to do it. But if you were crafting one, what is that data privacy and safety bill look like for you? It would probably be a, n a number of smaller bills. I mean, I don't know what the political expediency calls for, whether any of this could Dream ever get big. passed. And, yeah, then, and then yeah. Joe Manchin the, can pick it apart. Yeah, Although, the Jacob you know, Silverman privacy omnibus bill. I mean, we, we need to first, you need to stop the data trade here in the U.S. And this is something that uh, I've referenced Byron Tao's reporting, former Wall Street Journal guy who now has a new book out uh, about how basically the data brokers are tens of billions of dollars annual industry. Uh, here in the U.S., they're selling information about everything you do and consume and everywhere you go, down to the most intimate details, to all kinds of companies. <clears throat> Pardon me, including insurers and tech companies and ad networks and especially the U.S. government, the Pentagon, and the intelligence industry. So you need so laws to regulate that. the surveillance is still happening from the United States. They're, someone's just making a profit off of it, where it, China Absolutely. might circumvent it and be like, no, 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 you're not going to sell us back our, our uh, this data the U.S. is like, you can tell us back the data, we'll buy it. Yeah, and in China, they might say, hey, uh, we're going to order these companies to basically send us this stuff every month or give us a real-time feed because they can do that. But they might also use any number of cutouts or uh, make deals overseas to buy this kind of data right. uh, because that is very much possible and certainly there's very little limitation on it. So you need kind of international measures also that and you know mutual treaties and... and efforts to really manage the data trade internationally and talk about you know, what kind of stuff should be collected in the first place, what should be sold or should not be sold. And it can't be done company by company or even perhaps region by region, because as I said, like, you know, TikTok isn't necessarily the only Chinese thing in your phone, if that's really what we're, we're worried about right now. Right. But you need to work, think more about these economies and these systems that you know, this is the whole basis of, of, of how this stuff runs is this kind of surveillance capitalist economy. So treat those kinds of issues more and, you, and you'll have a more broad and I think useful approach, really. Surveillance capitalist economy is just so chilling to me. Um, and I, uh, I, I did want to ask because you have a forthcoming book, um, Gilded Rage, Elon Musk and the Radicalization of Silicon Valley, which I love. And, you know, You've written a lot about these tech moguls who are anything but libertarian um, when it comes to how they can use their money um, to influence the political system. Um, but just on that, you know, finally on TikTok, you know, one of those people who is, uh, I guess, a billionaire um, is Steve Mnuchin, who's like trying to put together like maybe some cohort to buy it. But then you also have Jeffrey Yass who you've, you've written about and you've talked about, um, who doesn't want TikTok to be sold because he's got um, 
shares in it or, or a large share of it. But like the way that our social media platforms, like I, I would rather have the fucking CCP have my data than Steve fucking Mnuchin. And for me, where all this came to a head, because people might be thinking, what's the big deal? Well, OK, what's the big you've got Elon, you know, just sort of allowing anti-Semites to troll Jews on uh, Twitter uh, endlessly. But then on the other hand, you know, I feel like I had a psychic break around the Cambridge Analytica stuff with Steve Bannon and the amount of data that was used to psychograph the American uh, electorate in 2016, right, which we knew then had obviously was one of the contributing factors to Donald Trump's victory. That's a really long um, wind up to ask, how do we stop right wing billionaires from owning all of our like means of communication? It's just wildly um, I don't know if it's undemocratic is the word, but just terrifying. Yeah, and I think at this point, a forced sale of TikTok would, would just send it into the hands of someone like Mnuchin or even Jeffrey Yass, the He's the Susquehanna Group co-founder, financier guy, billionaire who t checks all the right wing boxes, who um, he probably doesn't want it sold uh, uh, as, a, as a force effort, but he could easily... Um, you know, step up his ownership stake when it is sold. And it is very frustrating that some of these same people are the ones who claim that they're defending free speech. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can take a very cursory look at anything Elon Musk has done in the last couple of years or his business record and understand that he doesn't care about free speech and, and X doesn't care about, about free speech. Um, you know, we, we still have the capability out there to have um, you know, worker run companies and kind of more equ equitably, excuse me, equitably designed systems and, and economies of scale that don't work on the exploitation of consumer data. Um, I would hope that we move towards that in some way. I don't see any easy answer. Another reason why this frustrates me is because the Biden administration, I think one of the areas where it has done a pretty good job is antitrust and, right. and, and some of this consumer protection, breaking up companies, suing companies, and it's it's messy. It doesn't always work. It takes a, it takes a while. But you don't want just an, an, another billionaire to own this billion user company TikTok here in the U.S. without anything fundamental changing about how this industry is being run. Because as you said, right now you just have kind of a new a new group of digital age Mur Rupert Murdochs who um, who don't care at all about the common good or democracy or or voting or or our civil rights, which is basically what I'm writing about in this new book. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and lastly, I was just going to ask, like, for me, I mean, I, I would just say, like, the fact that Tr Biden is good on antitrust, again, offers this sliver of a window to wedge our pressure in, you know, and to actually exploit and to say, you know, keep going when it comes to, like, actually, you know, taking Google to court. Um, tr like, let's let's go. Let's break them up. Um, but this for sale is just such a weird digression. It seems like moving backwards um, when it comes to all of that, especially, yeah, we don't know who might buy it. And God, Jeffrey, yes, who's you, mm. whose politics are just just as heinous as any of these billionaires, you know, anti-union, um, pro charter school and all that, as you talked about, it's just like that's not a solution either. But isn't the answer, Jacob? just to tax these motherfuckers out yeah. of existence. Yes. I, I think that's also perhaps the simplest one, really, right? Yeah. Because you're going you're gonna to reduce their power. You're going to reduce their wealth. You're not going to sort of pick at edge cases or, or, you know, wait for one of these people to commit a heinous crime that you can prosecute. Right. And then, you know, I think one thing looming over this, too, is that the government, I think, will and probably should have a say in how some of these industries develop. I mean, we have the Internet and a lot of the technologies that, that have resulted since because of government investment. But you want it to be done democratically and, and to move and, to, and you know, for the social and common good and to sort of move society in the right direction. So, you know, in that sense, forcing a sale of, of a quasi Chinese company to an American oligarch, not so good. <laughs> <laughs> putting some U.S. government dollars in, into uh, building manufacturing here may be a little bit better. And um, if, if you at the same time finally tax these people in a real way in which they don't have like nation state style resources, then we can do more of that, I think, more, more sort of CHIPS Act type building for everyone. 
Uh, Jacob Silverman, thank you so much for stopping by. I appreciate you, and I'm excited for your book. Everybody, for now, Easy Money, Cryptocurrency, Casino Capitalism, and the Golden Age of Fraud is out. You should have read it um, yeah. or read it now. And um, yes, follow. Jacob, where can we find you and your work? I'm on uh, the site now known as X as Silverman Jacob. And I'm at jacobsilverman.com. And uh, there's contact info for me there. So there love go. to hear from people. There you go. It's a good old fashioned website. Well, I love it. Um, thank you guys for being here. Sorry about the technical difficulties, but I'm very excited uh, now that everything's been sorted uh, to bring in. Let me cue it up. New York based stand up comic actor and the host of the popular podcast, The Downside with John Marco Sorezi. John Marco Sorezi, hi. Hello, how are you? I'm hanging in there, dude. I was like, you know, I'm a little down, but uh, I'm okay. I'm, I think I'm, TikTok's going to be okay. Don't let it bother you too much. I'm not even on TikTok in a way that I'd like to be. Um, and I thought they were blocking the word Palestine years ago. <laughs> Sure, sure. They've been doing that. But anyway, John Marco, let's change it up, even though it'll be a little sad and serious. We're going to talk about the eclipse later. It'll be fine. Um, how are you? What are you bitching about today? Oh, God. I am very, I'm very, uh, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a traveling comedian. I see by the calendar and behind you. I know. I know. It's, it's, uh, that's, it's, it's inaccurate already. It was accurate <laughs> yesterday. I, uh, I'm, I'm going to Australia soon. Big flight, long flight. Ooh, yeah, I, I, I'm in New York, and I guess the the uh, the drug laws are very serious when it comes to like sleeping medication. They're very strict. And in I Australia? No, I'm going to Australia for shows. Right, but that's where the drug drug. No, the strict here. I'm trying to get. Here's oh. what it is. I take Ambien. I take Ambien now and no then. Not too much. Nothing crazy. But that's not strong enough for me to fall asleep on a plane. So I go to my doctor and I say, you know, could I get one Xanax for the flight to Australia? And he says, no, there's no, and, and he says, they cannot in New York, they track it to a T. You can't have one of the other. And I wanted to say to him, doc, I'm going to get, I'm going to get this Xanax. No matter what. One way or another. <laughs> yes. I'd, I'd love to, to get the, the right amount through the medical system. And uh, he he said he said ah you could go to you go to California it's a little bit easier there bullshit barely state. barely that's what he said he acted like like in in L A I walk in and with my Botox they give me a free Xanax on the way out they say take this in case you're feeling I you mean they should that. so I'm very I'm very annoyed by what it feels like whenever sometimes I ask for the doctor for either a medication for this or that. It just sounds like he's talking to me in a way that it would be, um, if I quoted it in court, he would be okay. So I never get a real answer. I never get to really talk to him. He's just always speaking in kind of vague, well, maybe this, well, maybe that. So I could never get him in trouble. And then I don't trust my doctor. Yes. And then I don't sleep on the plane. Uh I have some experience with this. Um, I also, my husband takes Adderall and every single month it's a massive fight to be able to get another Adderall prescription that he's been on for forever. But they speak to you like, yes, like you're an addict. Basically how they have, have been speaking to mostly black and brown patients whenever they want pain medicine. Uh, now sure. like the directive is, no, speak to everyone like that, which we've talked about on this show only makes people, as you're saying, go search for it elsewhere, even if it is, you know, pain medicine, some people do need oxycodone, you know, like they do need to be on that. Um, it's not everyone is just getting high. And it's so like, we've talked about how it pushes people to the black market for how prohibitive it all is um, to say nothing. And this is, these are people like, I'm assuming you have some amount of health insurance. Like I'm, you have a doctor. Uh, yes, I, ha I have, a, I have a doctor. And uh, I mean, that's the only reason I'm on the show. I'm just hoping, you know, some people could send me some of their stuff. I could get through this time period of my life. It's just some plan doctor, C and yes, the, the doctor was expressing how frustrated he was with New York system. And he's like, it's a little bit too strict. And it just he had the audacity to say to me, he said, a uh, part part of uh, what might help you fall asleep is you got to give yourself permission to fall asleep. <laughs> and I 
I almost th threw him through the window that was not even in the room. It was so, so patronizing. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of screwed. I got to figure it out. I'm going to have to go to my mom probably say, Hey mom, can you help me out? And my mom's got, my mom's got it. It's well, mom, yeah. maybe mom, if mom is a Zanny, that'd be great. But also let me do this very quick. I'm so sorry. Sunset Lakes, save a day. <laughs> Sunset Lakes CBD ad read. Give me a one second. Cause maybe this would help. Um, John Marco, bear with me as I um, let you know about. We have a sponsor on the show. Not sure if you knew that. For sure, the first, sure. Very exciting. Um, Sunset Lake CBD is a Vermont based, vertically integrated farm that grows and harvests and processes all of its organic, pesticide free CBD products. And they have like awesome tinctures that one of them is a sleep tincture that has CBD and CBN, which is basically old weed but not but not it's not no thc um it's not psychoactive at all it helps me get to sleep and stay asleep um they also have gummies the good night gummies that have cbd and cbn and melatonin they got all kinds of stuff they got lotion they got coffee they got fudge they've got um all kinds of like focus gummies it's great sunsetlakecbd.com coupon code frantifa john marco f-r-a-n-t-i-f-a -A. they also have an upcoming 420 sale We'll let you know about that a little bit, but 20% off all your order, sunsetlakecbd.com. Thank you, John Marco. Sure. Do you have any with a, a Xanax in the middle? Because that sounds good there, to me. I mean, there's some ashwagandha. That's like Xanax of nature. <laughs> that sounds intense. Ashwagandha. That sounds like what you take when you want to see God. Oh, I know. I wish. It's like, do you want to sleep on this flight or do you want to see God at 38,000 feet? Sure. I mean, you know, <laughs> frankly, if you're flying Boeing, you might be seeing God without either. <sighs> John Marco, before we jump in, I wanted to just ask you, because it's been since the start of this assault mm. on Gaza, this genocide, this war, whatever you want to call it, that you've been on. And you have also been outspoken about what's happening. And you've been kind of a pillar. And I've been so happy um, to have a, another friend in comedy. Um and also a Jew who mm -hmm. is speaking out about this. And, and that hasn't come without consequences and specifically, and I don't want to, you don't have to talk about it if you don't want to, but we know. No, that, I'm comfortable with anything. I, I'm fine. Okay. But that in this industry, like people have gotten other folks fired, whether in, in, in all kinds of entertainment because of their stances on Gaza. Um, share your experience and, or how has that affected you, if at all? I, I, I do think that I'm fortunate in the sense that I'm I'm not quite big enough to deal with like the intense consequences of it, which is why I think it's important to challenge myself to uh, embrace the stances I feel passionate about publicly. Because I think you got to do it. You got to you got to hold yourself uh, accountable on your way up. You can't just wait till you're at the top and then make some big stance. Uh, then, then you have a lot of excuses and a lot and of ways just to get out of it. 2012. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so I was just like, I, I just Twitter uh, X is is where I felt, um, you know, where I just felt like the the best. Uh, yeah, there's plenty of bad information on Twitter where people were posting a, a lot of things and showing a lot of these these war crimes and mm -hmm. these horrible things happening. So it just started with like you know, uh, uh, an occasional retweet or whatnot. And, and then eventually kind of sh just shared some of my own thoughts. And, um, there was the, the only, the only real consequences, there was a club here mm -hmm. where the booker, uh, tried to get another comedian banned from a club for essentially their pro-Palestinian views. And, and then I publicly called out that, that, that booker and, you know, again, it wasn't it wasn't a big club that I was I was uh, kicked out of, but they, but I will never work that club again. And sure. And ultimately, you know, I've been at clubs where some comedians will say to you, you know, you're careful, careful about this. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of Jewish people in comedy. There's a lot of Jewish people in in Hollywood. It's just a, a reality. It's part, partly because that was the uh, that was one of the industries we were allowed to participate back in vaudevillian days. Right. Right. Um, I, I think it's more just that you can feel the the pressure of 
of of Jewish people assuming that as a Jew we're on the exact same page politically. Yeah. And it can be hard moment by moment just being like letting your uh, views be known, knowing that you're going to piss off those people. I had a meeting. Um, I'll keep this vague, but it was like a, <laughs> a potential meeting for for something big. And one of the people there was much older. Uh -huh. He's Jewish. And he comes up to me after the meeting and, and says, essentially, like, so how I don't mean to put on a Jewish voice. That's my old man voice. <laughs> Just, Just how I sound when I do old man. Oh, this thing. How do you how do you talk about everything going on with Israel? And the way that it was asked, it was one of those things where I'm like, you assume what my position is on this, which is a very Zionist. Uh, you you are asking me in a very professional setting where I am very much uh, uh, on the lower. I don't have the power here, right, at all. And furthermore, if I were uh, uh, Palestinian, if I were Muslim, if I if I were not uh, a, a member of the tribe, you you wouldn't be interacting with me in this way or you would be you would have views or you wouldn't want to bring me onto the thing so you just feel while it's not a direct he didn't say to me hey you're, we're going to give you the big movie deal if you pledge your allegiance to to israel you can feel the tension of of it being accepted as a as a matter of fact that to even criticize israel would would be akin to uh, post 9-11 uh, uh, saying like Al-Qaeda is making some good points like that. Right, right. <laughs> that's the way that, that it's, it's present or was presented. And then yeah. and then as as anyone who, who studies anything could see that, you know, the, the mood shifts as the numbers become so fucking unbearable. Um, so so that's what I've I've felt. And so and what I, did you say? Of course. Well, oh, oh, I, 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 I avoid it. My shirt. I had the Israeli star right there. I said, <laughs> he said, hey, you're signed, buddy. Um, no, in that moment, I, listen, there's some moments I'm proud of. And there's some moments I don't go. I don't do that. But I go, uh, it's everyone's. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah, it's out crazy there. out there. And then I walk away as fast <laughs> as I can. I, I think they're all full of shit. What are you going to do? The world's crazy. Um. And, and uh, you know, for me, I think I made the decision of like tr at least Twitter, which feels like the most uh, direct line to my thoughts. That's where I'm going to be the most vocal. Yeah. Um, but I think it's tricky with comedy. My, my opinion, at least in, of my uh, what I want comedy to be is I never I don't try to have a lot of comedy where I'm in the right or yeah. I'm like, oh my God, I made balloons pop up. I didn't even Wow, to... gosh. <laughs> You're magic. Peace for everybody. I, I just don't, I think what's what's tricky about doing comedy is like, I have some jokes, jokes, but the problem is if if I'm sharing like, uh, frankly, like, you know, a, a something critical of Israel and the, the audience applauds, that's also not what I'm trying to do on stage. So it's trying sure. to figure out like where, where, um, where am I a comedian and where am I a human being and where can I use, I, I, I feel so arrogant to be like my platform, but where can I, um, you know, uh, uh, combine the two. And well, yeah. yeah, no, I think I really appreciate cause we, you know, this is ostensibly a comedy show as well. Uh, we have comics on, we don't always do comedy, but we don't always talk about the industry and the ways that, you know, especially right now, there are very prominent Jewish comics who are incredibly mm -hmm. Zionist and who actually, I think, behind the scenes are probably having a role in some of the blacklisting that we see, although the tide is turning um, more so in my lifetime than in any time. I mean, for the most, yeah, the most in my lifetime, I guess I've seen American public sentiment shifting, uh, especially also young Jewish American public sentiment shifting. For sure. But it is, it's very... Um, it is really difficult to one, know how to navigate it professionally so that you like still get meetings, but then two, know how to navigate it on stage so that you can speak to the moment, but also keep it light and funny. And like, actually, you know, one of my friend and comic, Sammy Obeyed, who is I saw him, kind of, I saw him yesterday. Last yeah. Time. I mean, Sammy's great. And, but also Sammy is like, has always been kind of a like set up punch kind of like 
pun pun heavy although yeah. smart pun heavy comic and in some ways it's like the most brilliant and perfect way to talk about what how heinous everything is is just like pun 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 and he's you know part palestinian like all this but it is um you don't want to bum everyone out but you're also like you know what i mean it's like also the elephant in the room so um yeah, but I think that's really interesting, like you saying on the way up, like it's usually people once you get really mega famous is when you're like Leonardo DiCaprio and you're like, w I'm just going to post about sea turtles. Sure. Forever. And, and I feel I feel especially um, I feel like I, I really do feel justified in criticizing my fellow comedians, especially the more the more famous, the Amy Schumer's of the world. The, yeah. uh, the Tiffany Haddish's of the world, the Jerry Seinfeld's of the world, because they have a platform. They have a platform. And uh, I, I actually, before um, I started working with <laughs> sort of a, a representative in, in the business mm -hmm. who might also represent uh, Amy Schumer, Ooh. I kind of asked someone in advance. I said, hey, <laughs> just so you know, I've, I've had uh, two, two uh, very uh, harsh tweets about this person. Is that uh, is that cool? And they were like, they were like, you know, uh, we we generally ask our clients to try to be respectful of one another, but ultimately, you do you, and you have to because at the end of the day, you got three to five agencies that represent all of show business, and I think so much of the general public, if they understood that, you know, some agent represents their liberal hero and. Uh, 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 you know, Tucker Carlson, they'd go, oh my God. You know, just when you're in show business, you just realize uh, the, the money's all flowing partially yeah. to the same source, even if they're on uh, uh, diametric sides of, of the so, aisle. Yeah. The, okay, first of all, look out, but also maybe like, I'm, I'm like, I'm curious. I'm very curious because you've had some, not just like g tweets about Amy Schumer, but fire viral funny tweets about how much that woman is losing her mind. Um, but on the agents thing, and then we'll move on. But uh, my former agent represented Tommy Laren. You know Tommy Laren, right? Remind me. It sounds She's, familiar. She's oh, she is. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. She kind of was like pre-Trump, but like as he ascended, yeah. Um, you know, I hate Beyonce. White people she are under attack. In trouble because she said she was pro-choice. Pro choice at one point, yeah, yeah. and then like, mm -hmm. yeah, walk that all the way back. And she, he dropped her, um, or I mean, she dropped her. He let go of her, and also a massive golden goose at that point. Uh, and I looked at him. I was like, "You are on the right side of history. <laughs> like, God will reward you." And it's like, "God will reward you," but basically, like, you will yeah, be yeah. the angels will herald you up. Um, because she is vile, and I, you know, I was just like, "Do not represent someone like that. That's awful." And uh, yeah, he no longer represents me. Sure. I'm always curious if there will come a day, you know, and again, this just depends on how how wise the general population gets is whether there I feel like there have emerged certainly uh, managers, which for those listeners, they if an agency represents a lot of people, manager is more focused and, and more focused on the kind of the longer trajectory. I imagine there's some managers out there already who have more, quote unquote, right wing clients. And play, yeah. you know, have more ins at the Daily Wire than, uh, you know, Bravo. And I wonder if that will ever spread to the agency level. It, it's hard to imagine because there's such a, it's it's there's such a monopoly really to a degree between you know the three major agencies. But I yeah. always wonder if there will come a day where ideologies will force these agencies, and it's really up to the big money making clients if they want to make a big stink and say, why the fuck is Tucker Carlson right. uh, being repped by my agent? Well, uh, and back I, to, I mean, back to this issue at hand, like I actually draw no distinction uh, between the likes of Tucker Carlson and someone who is defending Israel's actions right now. Sure. I mean, truly it is, sure. it is a right wing genocidal project and the right salivates over Israel um, and the idea that we could, hey, we could bring that here. We could have massive walls. We could do apartheid. Why don't we do apartheid? Um, and they don't admit that. I mean, this is Mike, uh, Michael Rappaport will never admit that to himself. Dick Stain, Donald Trump. Uh, but knowing that Donald Trump loves Bibi Netanyahu and Israel, 
Um, and like is like, why don't we do all the stuff they do to Palestinians, but to black Americans here and et cetera and migrants and whatnot? I loved I, it was so many liberals, especially b- before uh, October 7th, they, they would they would describe Netanyahu as a fascist and they hated Netanyahu. And yeah. then and then all of a sudden they were like, we got to go with Israel's plan. And I'm like, oh, oh, so. So you think we should go with the plan of the guy you said was a fascist, who you who you went on stage and did comedy about it being such a fascist and fuck this guy. And and suddenly we're supposed to support the the entire uh, unquestioning the entire plan of the person you said was a fascist. Yep. You said was a fascist. And uh, it's it's embarrassing. And now um, they're turning on BB. They're like, no, but we, we just don't want him at as the brand, but we want his plan. Yeah. We just don't want his face. Um, this is, by the way, a very long extended uh, what are you bitching about? We do have, I want to just do one story with you that is is related to this, um, which is the way that some right wingers are coming around when it comes to calling what Israel is doing in Gaza a genocide or at least calling it out, which is actually more concerning <laughs> than anything else for me. But so broadly speaking, we know that the right in the United States is very Zionist. There's Christian Zionists. Obviously, it's get all the Jews to Israel. Yay, because then, uh, um, you know, those who won't convert when Jesus comes back will perish. You know, cool uh, allyship stuff. Um, And as we just said, they're super pro-militaristic. And we heard Representative Tim Wahlberg basically say, why don't we just Nagasaki or Hiroshima, Gaza, get it over with Mm. quickly? that there would be the difference between a Republican and a Democrat in office right now. Not a lot, but a big enough difference. Um, But then there's the likes of people like Candace Owens, who was recently let go uh, from the Daily Wire for, I believe, among other things, uh, this tweet, of course, is weeks ago, uh, no government anywhere weeks ago. This was in November. No government anywhere has the right to commit a genocide ever. There's no justification for a genocide. I can't believe this needs to be said or is even considered the least bit controversial to state. Um, And that was, again, so long ago. Um, Obviously, this is broken clock syndrome. But then there's some other broken clocks we got going on. Alex Jones. Israel has lost the high ground. And this is in a quote tweet where we saw that drone footage of those three young boys uh, being murdered. Israel has lost the high ground. This is not war. It is robotic mass genocide. Section 1091 of Title 18, the United States Code, prohibits genocide, whether committed in the time of peace or time of war. Genocide is defined in 1091, includes violent attacks with specific intent to destroy whole or in part a national, ethnic, or racial, religious group. What? Alex Jones. And then finally, before I kick it to you, uh, John Marco, this from Joe Rogan, who in 20 minutes before this conversation is like, I mean, why can't I link vaccines and autism just again and again and again, the highest paid podcaster, um, you know, Spotify's golden goose. Here's what he had to say. I want to know what was she, what she was fired for, because was it criticism of Israel? Was it I mean, did she show that Edward Snowden video that he put up on Twitter that shows them oh, maybe drone bombing those kids that are those men, I should say, unarmed people that were walking towards the rubble that yeah. clearly weren't causing yeah. any danger to anybody? Like they were always saying they're only targeting Hamas and everybody else is a casualty. Well, if those guys are just unarmed civilians and they're walking alone, that's what they appear to be. Dresden. And you just blast them from the sky with robots because if you can't talk about that, if you can't say that's real, then you're saying that genocide is okay as long as we're doing it. And that is what we're saying. And if you're saying that from a perspective of someone who literally went through the Holocaust or your your people, your tribe went through the fucking Holocaust and now you're willing to do it. John Marco, this little turn uh, is actually <laughs> to me a little more concerning than exciting. These are not the bedfellows that I want uh, when it comes to this issue. But what do you think? I think I've I've two I have two thoughts. One I one I think is uh folks like Joe Rogan, uh sometimes for better and sometimes for worse, are less tied to uh needing the powers that be, the generalized powers that be. And by that I mean uh, you know, you get to go on the tonight show, you get to go on the new, you get to do all these right. kind of more mainstream things. 
connected to uh, Lord show Michaels business. is not Michael meeting with him. Yeah. So he's free in the sense that he can share a thought uh, independently. Sometimes it's a good thought. Sometimes <laughs> it's a bad thought. Sometimes uh, the 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 mainstream thinking, particularly, I would argue, uh, scientifically, can is usually stronger. And then other times, when it comes to uh, politics or, or geopolitical affairs, it is a little more biased and skewed. And that's you know that's an understatement. The second thing, though, I want to say, and this is more for Candace Owens, who I have uh, no real respect for, and 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 all those influencer types, yeah. is that to me they're they're a, a a brand. Candace Owens is is a, is a brand, and she's looking out for her company, and it's the same way of like if Nike, I uh, I uh, you know, let's say Nike um, does some ethical actor. Nike's like, we are going to support, uh, uh, forgive me. What, what, what was the football player who was, who was basically couldn't get on the team. He kneeled during the anthem. Oh, um, yes. Uh, <laughs> we're so bad. Um, come on chat. Yeah. Help me. Uh, oh, oh yeah, Chris, uh, uh, Kaepernick. Kaepernick. So, yeah. Yeah. So if Nike, if Nike hires Kaepernick as a spokesman or whatever, you don't have to go. Nike's good. Nike right. made a calculated decision that ultimately for their uh, uh, brand standing in the world. Now you can go, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good. Uh, Kaepernick deserves flowers. Kaepernick deserves uh, some kind of compensation for being brave in the face of this thing. But you don't have to like Nike. And in that same sense, I, I, I refuse to believe, and I don't care even if it does, that Candace Owens, this particular cause she's uh, emotional about. She's ultimately a brand. I promise that she made that decision either seeing the way the tides were turning or going, mm -hmm. you know what? I can I can uh, uh, carve out my own thing over here. So I don't need to go brava Candace. I can just go, oh, the, 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 the tweet that she wrote there is true. I right. don't need to, the same way when Nike does something good, I don't have to go, well, Nike's good. Well, look at the history. Right. Look I mean, no one's heralding, yeah, like Bud Light for putting Dylan Mulvaney, you know, give, giving Dylan Mulvaney a, you know, sponsorship. It's it's they're making money moves. I mean, what's interesting about the issue of I think you're totally right when it comes to Rogan is that he there's literally nothing he can say that may, would make Spotify drop him. And he's and as you mentioned earlier, kind of one of the only issues you can truly get canceled over anymore. You got to like at least assault like mm, 50 to 60 people, number one. Mm -hmm. or, Unless you have an NFL contract already in place. <laughs> exactly. Or you have to speak out about Palestinian human rights. And those, and if you do, that is when you can truly, and people have been canceled. Um, and, and Candace will be totally fine. I guess the reason that it worries me is because these are actual anti-Semites, in my opinion. A Alex Jones hasn't really said the Jews do X, Y, and Z, but he's platformed everybody. You know, the Richard Spencers, the like David Dukes, all those fools, and the cabal and the establishment and the this and the that, and the powers that be are always sort of coded Jewish. Like that is kind yeah. of the way they run. And then Candace Owens is openly, you know, you know, embrace obviously Kanye West, but then Nick Fuentes, who's still a Trump supporter, um, you know, who's like, hey, when Trump comes back, maybe we should round up Jews, like that kind of stuff that he, that yeah. people are openly floating. Um, and so that's why I'm like, the only thing that is almost helped me, like, I'm just glad that the right is so on brand Christian Zionist on all this. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They love war. They don't care about Palestinians because when they start to come to maybe the realization that Israel's not the good guy is when like the actual anti-Semitism <laughs> might happen. Right. Which is sort of why like I'm concerned, which is, but like, and, and Matt and I, you know, my husband get into this conversation all the time, which he's like, Israel literally makes people anti-Semitic. Like the fact that their sure. actions, which they claim to do in the name of all Jews, turns people against Jews. Uh, and that's not a reason that that is like a far reason to be on the side, you know, to want to change the policy here. But it's just a, a natural um, reaction to what's going on, you know, is that 
dingbats who see this and are like, hey, that is bad. Uh, must be the Jew. You know, like the, the project of Zionism conflating Judaism and this ethno state actually makes Jews around the world less safe. 100% I agree. And I think on the other hand, though, you, you could argue if you were a Zionist that it 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 forces a lot of Jews to uh, embrace whatever actions they decide because they feel like it's the only way. Like, you know, when Biden says so sickeningly the way he goes that, you know, without Israel, Jews aren't safe. And as a Jew, it, it's so infuriating because you go like you are you are merely like throwing coal into the the. The, the, the flame of the anxiety of like, well, we need this or, or we're fucked. Right. And, then, and then you're going to, it, it's obviously the whole, the whole prospect of it is, is very dangerous because every government commits crimes in the history of the world. And so sure. you are going to equate a, a criticizing government with anti-Semitism. You are begging for more anti-Semitism. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, right. Ah. You're gonna have on Candace next week? Is that? Is, is yeah. That oh my God. No. She they, years ago they reached out to me and I was like, no thanks. I don't want to be your like leftist punching bag. Sure. Um. And also, you know why I don't want to do those shows is because I don't want to roll up and see how much money they have. Like okay. I went on Piers Morgan. That's fine. Like whatever. But like going to a, like a Daily Wire set and being like, y'all have all of this fucking money for your like twisted ass beliefs like that just like ew you put me up in this hotel and i'm eating yeah, this yeah, on yeah. a per diem fuck you like that would just make me so mad i'm like why don't we have an empire you know mm -hmm. um why don't we have an empire the yes the um anti-zionist said sorry uh okay this has been great and we have one more final segment. I'm going to leave the discussion of how Trump Trump and his and Stephen Miller's law firm want to be the ACLU of white people. Sure. Um they're planning that for the uh, second term. We'll talk about that tomorrow in uh, our bonus. But John Marco, there's an eclipse coming up. Mm. Yeah, a solar eclipse, 4 minutes and change or something of uh just darkness. And um Apparently, big things happen during eclipses. I don't know any of them, but I'm sure JFK Jr. was shot during an eclipse, and I'm sure Abraham Lincoln was shot during an eclipse, and I'm sure that 9-11 um, was an eclipse time or yeah, something. For but sure. <laughs> they say that eclipses um, coincide, and by they, I mean uh, astrologers on Instagram, say that eclipses coincide with big events, Right. And actually to the right and like nut jobs are going with this and saying that, yeah, there there might be something with this eclipse. Um, first, here is a page who put this out. Here is a tweet about the path of the eclipse in the uh, northeast of the United States where it's going to be passing through. And this person on Twitter incredible has pinpointed all of the spots that like according to them correlate like why is the eclipse passing through all of these uh historic places and now mind you about two-thirds of them are places where there have been mass shootings which like let's be real that's not that hard in the united states for an eclipse to happen to pass through a bunch of st states where there have been mass shootings because there's been mass shootings in every fucking state but they are Eagle Pass, which is nothing. It's just a city. Like Uvalde school shooting, Waco massacre, JFK assassination, Bill Clinton birthplace, Rose Law Firm, who? Whitewater, Jonesboro school shooting, Padua school shooting, Mike Pence birthplace, Kent State massacre, East Palestine train derailment, Buffalo mass shooting. It just like, so it's like, don't we see the connection? This is, thank you, random Twitter guy, says Paige. Um, but then here's Alex Jones, and I promise there was there was two Alex Jones, uh, wait, yes, two Alex Jones quotes. Um, here's Alex Jones saying that, no, this is an excuse to create martial law to establish, the right is very excited about martial law. They cannot wait. They're like, oh, it's martial law. Yeah. Um, 
And it's because, you know, there have been warnings issued to Americans about looking into the eclipse. Because if you guys remember the last time there was an eclipse, I believe it was 2017. And um, people looked at the sun directly. Um, here's this poor gentleman staring right into the sun on the day of the eclipse. Um, he later was able to find his glasses and uh, put him on. Th that is Donald Trump for those listening. We all remember. And I got to say, John Marco, like I've never... I've actually never identified harder with Donald Trump than in this moment because I know I shouldn't, but I did do a little, like I did a little peek at the of sun. Of course. I naked. mean, everyone was joking like, oh, what an idiot. He looked right at it. And I'm like, well, he seems to be okay. So maybe <laughs> this was not He's a great fine. example. Maybe it helped him. Um, maybe. Okay. So here's Alex Jones on what he thinks is going to happen during this eclipse. But there is zero reason for all of this other than the government trying to scare people and create fear, but that's secondary, and, 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 and promote mumbo-jumbo. But what it is, because I've got all the articles and all the documents right here, is a martial law drill. So this is a test of the Obama kill switch, of martial law, of a government takeover. Now behind him is, I think... Apocalypto? Is that the Mel Gibson movie? I think so, yeah. Apocalypsis or Apocalypto, but it's basically like there's like a ritual sacrifice, a Mayan sacrifice, I believe. Um, and there's an eclipse right at the, like the pivotal moment, and everyone's like looking up, um, which is just hilarious. But I love that like eclipses as evidenced by apocalypto like you know just the idea that like they were always seen as these crazy events and you know societies for so long have like, seen them as as om om like um whatever uh omniscious i can't i don't know words today sure but then in like in effect alex jones is doing the exact same thing just in the year 2024, like, what does the eclipse mean? You know, like, it's going to be, the, the civilization is collapsing. There's going to be martial law. They're using it as a pretext. And, da, da, da. and then he's got his documents and he goes through them. And it's basically just like, hey, General Lloyd Austin says, don't look right up at the sun. <laughs> like, like, hey, CDC says, don't look at the sun. Hey, President Biden says, don't look at the, like, all of these people are just like, watch out. Don't look at the sun. Be prepared, hospitals, because people are going to come in having stared at the sun. It's going to be tough. I mean, I'm sure Alex Jones goes around the house. He sees the bleach, says don't drink. He's like, what do they not want us to know? Exactly. The same shit. So anyway, I want to know, oh boy, this is a long wind up to get here. What do you think is going to happen politically, socially, entertainment news? Hang on. I'm going to run this clip. This is Total Eclipse of the Bray. I'm having a total eclipse of my brain. John Marco, what could happen? It ha it's, it's Monday, April 8th. Um, what, what, sh what shall the, uh, the not sun bring? Well, I think that day I'll, I'll be flying back from some gigs in Texas. So I, I, I think uh, uh, somehow... Uh, this eclipse will, will, um, you know, I think, I think will make my plane, uh, uh, go safely. And it wasn't going to because of <laughs> Boeing, but because of the eclipse, they'll make a sudden turn. It gets in their eyes and, and, uh, it'll, it'll actually land safely, even though it's a Boeing, uh, uh, seven, whatever seven. So that's my oh. hope is, is that, is that, uh, all the planes are safe from the eclipse. And that's, that's all I can hope for. I like that. I was just hoping that like one of our two front runners for president, something happens with them. You know, not like I mean, obviously, you know which one I'd like it to happen with. I mean, I'm fine with either of them something happening, but like what if it if, made them younger? What if what if the eclipse suddenly they it took 10 years off? I would off? love that. I would love it if it takes 10 years off and they're sure. just they're just like running laps and shit and they're getting up, they're they're juicing. Um yeah. They you're spitting out full coherent sentences. I mean, yeah, we could we could really use 10 years or maybe they switch like some sort of freaky Friday situation. Sure. And they they realize they realize each other's perspective, which is they, 
Switch mostly the same perspective. Mostly the same. They go back and they're like, not even more of a Zionist than I was before. That's what's going to happen. <laughs> That's what I think. I think something like that. Um, or like I'll get a call from Mr. Hollywood, you know, and I'll be like, hey, come work on my big feature film. Sure. I'm holding a Stanley Cup to my face, even though it's not a Stanley Cup. I, I once had I once had a, uh, an old manager and I asked why haven't I been getting any auditions recently? And she said, well, you know, Mercury's in retrograde. <laughs> That's what that's the excuse that I use for my tech stuff failing me earlier in the show. Um, but that really, you know, I you live in New York, John Marco, and I think y'all are a little bit more grounded. Whereas when you move to LA, uh, you're you do have an eclipse of the brain and you suddenly are blame Mercury being in retrograde for truly everything. Um or Mercury in reggaeton, as my good friend says, mm. which is a lot more fun. Um well TBD, hey, maybe um, the U.S. will stop selling and sending weapons to Israel. That'd be tight. Or be nice. maybe World War III kicks off. Either way, tomato, tomato, um, we'll just play with fate until we let the planets decide for us. John Marco Cerezi, this has been a weird, discombobulated, but wonderful show with you. Um, where can people find you and follow your work? You can find me everywhere at John Marco Cerezi. It's spelled with a G. I'm touring all around the country and Australia and Europe. Uh, and then listen to my podcast, The Downside with John Marco Cerezi. Okay. And you will hit me up when you're next in I LA. 100%. I'll throw a lot of quartz at you if you don't. <laughs> I'll something like that. Anyway. Okay. Be very well, John Marco. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you guys for being here, uh, for rolling with all of the punches today. Whew. Thanks so much, Donald James, for being a member on YouTube. And Camperman says, one year, even blurry, you look marvelous, Fran. Here's to another year. Thank you. Morbius Dragon, appreciate you also for gifting a uh, sub. Um, Donald James says, yeah, get bonus content because of the patron. Yes, patrones. Randall Smith says, Sam Bankman fried was a symptom of billionaire scammers. Yeah, and we have not learned our lesson, have we? Balls Capone, thank you for becoming a new member on YouTube, uh, you, which also entitles you to watch back all of the bonus content. Um, Biometro Metronome says we really need to ban Tinder. Is that a Chinese company? Hmm. Um, Charles Whippen said their feudal lords went to, I think, talking about uh, the people who own all of our social media apps. Just Julie says, why isn't there an open source social media platform like Wikipedia? Super naive question, but it still seems plausible. Well, there, I mean, there is Blue Sky, which is now open for anyone to register. It is, it's, it's not buggy, but you can't like share a video and whatnot. It definitely seems like a safer space. I know that Jack, the original founder of Twitter was part of it. So like, take that for what you will. Um, but it doesn't seem to have the same, in fact, it does not have the same, um, sell you to advertisers model as the other apps do. So it's just a question of like convenience and the people who are on it. Um, we're in a bad way. We're in a bad way, but I completely agree. Like, and part of blue sky is actually not the commitment to not sell your data. Um, Robert, thank you for your super chat says the plutocrats who run this country are going to pull the plug on democracy, or at least they're going to try. Yeah. I mean, this is, we didn't get to do this story and I'll do it tomorrow, but um, this is effectively what a second Trump turn is, term is looking like. And, you know, we focus a lot on um, democracy and democracy, I guess, is important. But let's be real. Our democracy has been bought and sold by billionaires and they're looking at Biden and they're looking at Trump and they're like, Biden's going after our monopolies. Trump will allow us to buy his fucking <laughs> his buy buy into his cabinet. Which one am I going to choose? So let's be real. The billionaires are circling their wagons around Trump. They are choosing him. They are anointing him yet again. Um, and so it can get worse, um, even though I know when it comes to Israel, Palestine, it does not feel that way, but it can. Um, thank you so much for the surfs to for rating uh, our little feed here. Bad Lefty said, check Bad Hasbara, y'all. Great show. Yes, that is my husband's show, Bad Hasbara. Miss Kaylee, thank you so much for being a member. Tic-tac-toe Franny, you're winning. Um, and thanks, everybody. For now, guys, you know you get a shout out if you come a become a patron at 10 bucks or more um, because you're a wonderful, sexy human being.
Robo Cat, you both are wonderful. Thank you to the Big Tipper, Jonathan Cook, so sweet. I also think I have a tip, but my phone's over there, so I'll have to shout you out next week. We're going over to Twitch. Seaman Assassin, thanks for resubscribing. Fantastic time using Prime. Thank you so much, also 339409 for subscribing and Shitsky500, as well as Drake Graves for subscribing on Twitch. Everybody, support this show ad free. Me frazzled free. Let's just dance it out, people. And of course, thank you, thank you to Andy Vasoyan, Maximilian Inhoff, and Paige Omek, who just had a birthday. Happy birthday, Paige. Yay. We could not do this show without you. Everybody give Paige extra love now, then, whenever. Become a patron in honor of Paige. Become a Paige Trin is what I'm trying to tell you to do. Remember, we're streaming Wednesdays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. That Friday show is available to all. Wednesday shows are just the dessert, just a little. Just a little chaser for all the Fran Tifa out there to listen back and to watch back. And remember to follow the show on X, on TikTok, on Instagram, uh, Bituation Pod and Bituation Room, respectively. And remember to fight the power, fuck the patriarchy, free Palestine. Don't just bitch about it. Be about it. I'll see you Tuesday. Or just